So, to set it up, during one weekend while my friend's mum and sister were out shopping and such, I went over to her place just to chill and do what 13 year olds do. Jump on the trampoline and play with her doggos, duh. Eventually getting bored from being outside, we decided to play hide and seek in the house. To set up the house it took in, as best I can, she had two living rooms and the kitchen was in the middle of these. The carpet living room was to the far left, the tile living room was to the far right, and that's the one you see when you walk into the house. Clear view all the way down the hall when you get toward the kitchen. A wall separated the kitchen from the hallway, but you could still go around to get to the kitchen and living rooms, and then down the hall was the laundry, bathrooms, bedrooms, all that. And my friend's room was adjacent to the wall that separated the kitchen. She was closest to the front door. Everything was tile except the bedrooms and the left living room, so it was easy to hear people walking around. So I'm the hider, she's the seeker. She starts counting in the living room to the left. I immediately hide in her room and get under the bed with the door shut. I hear, ready or not. A few seconds later, she proceeds to go down the hall to the rooms. A few more seconds pass, and a door is heard being opened, followed by a triumphant, gotcha. Silence follows. Gentle but panicked footsteps are heard coming back up the hall. She quietly opens her bedroom door, shuts it, and then climbs under the bed with me. You know how whenever Shaggy and Scooby saw a ghost and they would get all fear stricken and white in the face? Pretty much how she looked. And when I went to ask her what was wrong, we both froze and held our breath as we heard slow, heavy footsteps coming up the hallway and they stopped right in front of the door. We genuinely thought someone had broken in because we saw a shadow on the other side and then realized there was no way to get into the house besides the front door or the garage door, which we would have heard or seen. It eventually went away, so we immediately got up and out, grabbed the scooters by the front door and got the fuck out. Once we were far enough away from the house, she told me she thought she had seen me running into the laundry, but wasn't entirely sure, so she checked it out anyway. It was small and quick enough to be me, I guess, so why not? And then nothing was there. That's when she freaked out and hid with me. While reciting this story to a friend I had over last year, she said something that actually scared me a lot more. What if my friend saw was hiding, running away from something else? And that's why we heard those heavy footsteps coming up the hall. What if there were two ghosts and the smaller one? just wanted a safe place to hide. I have a spirit in my house, or multiple, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure which I prefer. It first started when my family bought this house. We think the previous owner used a Ouija board and that it's laying under my sister's room. When I was younger, she experienced all the things, like my cat being pushed over after looking at it, dropping stuff, etc. She saw it close our locked laundry door. I used to wake up with random bruises, but whatever. My first encounter was when it imitated my sister. I got home, called out hi, and got a response back. Ten minutes later, she walked through the front door. There's no way she could have gone around without being seen or heard. Then a couple months later, I was sitting on my couch and I saw a spirit over the mattress. And it wasn't one of those situations where you see something out of the corner of your eye. There was a presence behind that, along with genuine 100% fear. A couple of weeks after that, I grabbed the Mac from my dad's shed. Whenever I'm alone there, I feel like I'm not. When I came in, I thought I heard a little girl's voice, which I thought came from my neighbor's house, grandkids. No one came or went that day. A couple weeks after that, I had my mates come over for a birthday sleepover, and while helping my friend when they were having a diabetic hypo, 
I felt like I was being actively watched and depressed. Then a few days ago, I saw something move behind the bar. And I don't say this lightly, but God, the thing behind there wasn't the little girl. Either there are two spirits in my house, one being a little girl and one being potentially malicious, or there is one spirit who disguised itself as a little girl, and it is powerful enough to oppress me and hide its presence. If this is a dangerous, please help, I beg. When I was aged about two to five, my family lived in a house that I'm convinced was haunted. I would have recurring nightmares almost every night. Toys would mysteriously move by themselves. I felt like I was never alone. Every time I think about that house, I feel like crying. There are a few other incidents that stand out though. I remember having this imaginary friend named Elizabeth. I think it was a ghost instead of just a friend my mind had made up. I felt her presence, but I don't remember ever seeing her. When I heard her voice, it was always annoyed or angry. I remember a few times she would tell me to do things, such as throwing toys at people, pushing glasses off table, tearing up a Bible, and I would do it because I was scared of her. My, the most memorable incidents was when my mother was in the hospital, giving birth to my sister. My father was in the hospital with her while my grandmother stayed behind to watch me. I was three at the time and was upset as I couldn't understand why my parents had left me alone for the night. My grandmother put me to bed and went to sleep in her room. I was crying so much I threw up, so I went to get my parents, forgetting they weren't home. I knocked on their bedroom door and a tall black figure of a man opened it. I had thought it was my father at the time, but looking back, the figure was too tall to my father and I never saw the figure's face. The figure spoke a much deeper, thundering voice than my father's. It snarled at me to stop crying and to go to bed, and it went back into the room. I remember being terrified and running back to my room. That was the only time I saw the figure. Fast forward, I'm at dinner with my family, and the conversation turns to the old house we used to live in. I told them about how I thought it was haunted, and telling them about how my father, the figure, yelled at me when I was up crying that night. My mother was confused and said she was in the hospital with my father, so that wasn't possible. I never thought much about it before, since my father was an asshole, and I wouldn't put it past him to snap at younger me like that. I realised that it in fact wasn't my father. My mother commented that she always had a strange feeling about that house. I'm a person who was very into lucid dreaming and is searching to have my first one. I've had a dream journal for about two years because of that. This is why I wrote this dream down. I have a lot of dreams about other things that are striking as well, but this is the most insane of them all. The time I predicted my aunt's cancer. I haven't seen my aunt in over 10 years at this point of this dream. When my grandfather died, all four of his daughters broke apart. Huge legal battles occurred and my family vowed to never see that side of the bloodline ever again. And that's how it was for 10 years. No communication, no texting, no birthday phone calls, not even anything from my cousins. I was 14 at the time, not a mature adult, so it was hard to make my own decision to speak to them, even if I wanted to. That part of my family was over, or so I thought. In August 2020, I had a dream so jarring that I woke up in tears. This is what I wrote down. Dream where I was given a day to prepare for surgery. I had a feeling I wasn't going to survive. It was for my uterus. I had cancer, sick. Lots of stressful crying and thinking about death. Horrible dream. 
The entire dream felt like ages, but it was all suffering and anxiety. That's sadly all the details I put down. It just felt so real, so raw, but I didn't feel me during the dream. I could just feel the stress and anxiety and fear. Anyway, fast forward to September 2020. My mother tells me to have a seat. She needed to talk. Jay, aunt, was sick. She had gone into a shock while bringing groceries inside her condo. According to her neighbour, she just stood outside looking at her front door for 10 minutes, not responding. Her neighbour and best friend thankfully saw this, went, oh shit, and went to help her. She guided Jay into her home and sat her down. This is when she went almost completely comatose and passed out multiple times. The ambulance was called and she kept having these jolting moments of consciousness. Confusion was infesting her mind, it seemed. She had no idea what was even going on or where she was. She went for testing while in the hospital and was told there was something very wrong. She had cancer of the uterus, or at least the doctors thought. Immediately, she had to go through testing and screenings. The cancer was so bad, there was nothing they could do but remove it all, hysterectomy. As if they didn't, it would travel to her stomach and eventually kill her. I didn't know the term at the time of my dream, just as I remember knowing my uterus has to be removed. During all of this, Jay was so positive, so grateful for life. She was amazing. The operation went well, after of course going through many months of chemo. I'm happy to say she has made an almost full recovery. Unfortunately, the type of cancer she has slash had was fallopian tube cancer. The survival rate, even after operation, is only five to 10 years. Because of this cancer, I reunited with my family. All is well now, and I'm so blessed to be with them. I told my mother I had this dream, and she said she believed me. I told her right after she informed me of Jay's health. My mom told me that all of the women on her side have had these abilities to pre pre predate things in dreams, deaths, cancers, etc. The women of my family have also felt this pull of wanting to go home, despite being home. I believe it may be blood related thing, I'm not sure. I try not to talk about it too much as it makes my mom very anxious. The only one I can talk to about this is another aunt of mine, P, who is a lifelong researcher of finding out the truth of what life really is. Something that I had no idea she did thanks to the 10 year gap of them not being in my life. And what boggles my mind is that I do the same thing, research NDEs, past lives, etc. Just as my aunt P does, yet I wasn't introduced to it by her at all. I found it naturally. Such a small niche and study, and yet here I am doing the same thing she has been doing. Weird how it all connects. My great uncle owns a lot of land in northern Saskatchewan, Canada. Some of this was pasture that he uses for cattle. But half of one of his largest properties is fenced off and the cows can't go there. In the sectioned off lactose free zone, the entire place is densely packed with foliage. I mean, when I hunt, I almost only use game trails and small clearings because a lot of the brush is too thick to get through without a machete. The ground itself is blotted with some small steep hills towards the entrance of the property. There is one main dirt road that goes from a Texas gate at the entrance all the way back to the farthest side of the property. Coming off the road in the hilly area, we have a camp. The camp consists of a camperized Atco trailer. Picture a big ass yellow sea can in front of the entrance, gated with barbed wire because sometimes my uncle will move his cattle to different fenced off areas of the land. With my mother's pulled behind trailer, that we can't pull anymore, sitting perpendicular to the ATCO 
and a tiny dingy 70s 14 foot pull behind that a family member gave me so I could have privacy at camp and not have to sleep with my mom. Needless to say, we spent a lot of time in the woods, and both my mom's and my door were facing the direction of the Atco, meaning I had a suedo alleyway between my door and my mom's wall. And finally, in front of the Atco trailer, we have a fire pit, and close next to it in front of my mom's place, there is a table for food prep. We've always had lots of wildlife, like big cats and bears that could harm people. I actually had to put down a bear that came into our camp and was far too comfortable with people not too long after. So from so since I was young, I learned to recognize the sounds and sights around me. I'm more cautious, I'm rarely afraid of anything out there, especially given that I'm usually armed when I'm not with multiple people. The summer before last, we had a remarkably calm experience there, where hardly any critters we had to deal with, and it seemed the bears and pests were leaving us alone. No droppings, many small game trails had grown in, and the camp that usually took two days to set up was exactly how we had left it the previous trip. It was peaceful. It being summer, I filled the days with woodworking, fishing trips, and the occasional hike looking for berries and setting traps for rabbits, grouse, and other small game that could be prepared quickly over the fire with. My family, but mostly came up unlucky. Regardless of the seeming lack of disturbances, we always were careful at night, making sure to have a bright light and keep lookout for anything. After the first week, we began hearing noises around the camp very late at night that would drive the dog insane all night to the point we just had to keep her inside but never saw anything. It almost felt like whatever it was was probing and checking out our camp nightly but always staying far enough away and hidden enough that we could never see it with our spotlights. Then one night, just like any other, bar the eerie quietness that usually came around that time, I left my mother's camper a couple hours after the daylight had. Disappeared with a lantern style LED light and as a rarity I didn't have anything to defend myself. No gun, no bear spray, not even a knife. So I was a little bit more cautious and observant than usual given I felt more vulnerable. As I walked from the exit of my mom's camper I looked around for a minute scanning the tree line and then began to loop around to my door. I panned as I walked from right to left from the entrance to the fire pit and then to the table. It was there just behind the table, not 20 feet away, that I saw a naked, extremely pale, almost gray, probably just because of the dark, lanky humanoid figure standing still and directly facing me. As it caught my gaze, I felt my heart drop and immediately went cold. I probably only stared for three seconds at most, but it felt like several minutes as my brain processed what I was seeing. It stood somewhere between six and a half and seven and a half feet tall, with low slumped shoulders and had a frail thin body that reminded me of photos from the Holocaust, but with disproportionately long limbs. I couldn't see the legs fully because of the table, but what I could see looked like sinew and skin stretched over the leanest and thinnest body I have ever seen. I know I might be sounding like a dramatic bitch, but I couldn't describe the primal fear and shock that came over me. It was like a combination of the feeling you get being threatened at gunpoint and hearing someone talk, stalk you in the woods, but ramped up to the point where I could barely think. I couldn't make out many details of the face but the light cast small shadows on the face that made it look like it had shallow features similar to a nose and lips and eye sockets that were smoothed down. Almost like Voldemort in Slenderman's love child. I ran like my life depended on it. To be honest, I thought it might have. The last few feet to my door. Once inside, I grabbed my shotgun, stuffed several shells in my pocket, loaded the gun, aimed it at the door. I sat in silence with the hammer, 
and walked back waiting for the doorknob to turn or the frosted glass to break. I sat and waited for hours into the early morning, expecting to see or hear something, but I never did. Not even any foliage moving or items moving. Eventually around 4am, I lowered my guard, propped the shotgun next to my bed and hesitantly went to sleep. When I woke up, hardly believe in what I seen the night before, I was around the area to see if there was any shapes or items that I could have mistaken and warped in my mind into the creature. I saw, but the only thing in that area was a table with some pots and pans on it that were blackened from the fire. I'm still not quite sure what to make of it, but I do have some ideas from what I witnessed, given the fact that I believe it was stalking us and staking out our camp for several nights, along with positioning itself between me and my mother's camp, directly in front of the path that I took every night, leads me to believe that it has some level of intelligence, comparable to low A person laying a trap or setting something up. As I mentioned, I looked around after exiting my mother's camper and never heard anything, which tells me that either it was waiting there, watching, or it's so incredibly quiet that I never heard it move. Even a leaf. Which wouldn't line up with us hearing the disturbances from the previous nights. It also left as quietly as it appeared, which leaves three options. Either it went out of its way to use the same road entering the camp that a person would for convenience. It silently crept out through the game trails. Or it didn't wave until after I had lowered my guard and my adrenaline died down. I'm honestly not sure which option is more likely or more off-putting. I'm not really sure what I saw, but I know it wasn't human. The photos and drawings of these crawlers reminded me a great deal of it. So I thought I'd share that maybe one of you could enlighten me as to what it could have been doing or its intent or provide an explanation to its behavior. I know it's not worth much online, but hand to God, I swear this isn't a piece of fanciful writing. And I would be happy to share any other details if anyone wants more info or further clarification. When I messed around with the Ouija board with my siblings, it would always say mysterious things like Anon is a poo-poo head. Very discouraging. But I didn't let the heckling of these mysterious spirits stop me. I started a journal of potentially paranormal happenings. Most of it's circumstantial and easily explained away. Odd noises, shadows that don't look quite right, animals acting strange, and shapes in the woods that seem to disappear before I got close. I'm sure some of you would lend more credence to a host of odd things happening over your childhood. But personally, I think the mind sometimes sees what it wants to see. And so I remained skeptical. And well, that's really how it stayed until I met my uncle Kevin. You see, my family is very, very, very Irish. A decent amount of us fought in the Civil War, and I have IRA relatives. But my uncle was unique even among all that. You see, he was a druid. I'm not talking about a hippie college druid who smokes way too much weed. I'm talking about a large man with a beard in his 60s, who meets with other old people to perform legitimate pagan rituals, mixed with a bit of the good old Irish Christianity. I'm not certain exactly how he reconciles the two, but I suppose through faith, anything is possible. Like me, he had a deep interest in the paranormal, Although with him, I suppose you could call it a more professional interest. He introduced me to some of our old ways, among them the Irish language and our old mythologies. The way he went on about traditions and our old practices made me feel comfortable talking to him about my own thoughts and experiences. I showed him my journal, told him about my forays into the dense Canadian forests and the stories I had read online. To my surprise, he took it all in his stride. I was expecting him to laugh me off or even get all serious and tell me to stop jerking around. Instead, he told me to keep it up, 
keep going hard at what I was passionate about. But he did give one serious warning. Be careful when interacting with the unknown. Kevin told me that he had met creatures from the fairy world several times, and it was his duty as a druid to keep the balance between our world and theirs. Just some context, we Irish seem to refer to absolutely everything paranormal as fairies. Ghosts, changelings, even the leprechaun are all fairies. Anyway, on the topic of fairies, Uncle Kevin told me that as a child, he was marked by the fairy world, and that's why he took up the mantle of a druid. Now to be warned, my uncle fully believes what I'm about to share, and while I do trust that he believes what he's saying, I think there could be other explanations. Apparently, as a child, fairy circles would appear around him if he stepped outside, basically a circle of mushrooms. He could often see odd figures in the distance that would disappear if pointed out. It was mundane things like that, until we got to the topic of his father, a cruel man from what I've heard. After a particularly hard beating, a sudden shriek exploded across the old Irish countryside, shattering all the glass objects in their poor old hut. The smell of old wrath and smoke penetrated through the old rotten doors, and my uncle was struck with an overwhelming urge to flee. Leaping from the hands of his now extremely distracted father, he burst out the door, running for the safety of the distant hills. Looking back, he saw the old bog behind their house had burst into a thousand tiny flames, dotting as far as he could see. Individually insignificant, but their combined power assaulted my uncle with an overwhelming stench and rush of smoke, making it hard for him to see or breathe. It's at this point of the story that he stops, looks at me, and makes me promise to take what he is about to say next very seriously. Of course, I'm ecstatic. This is what I've been looking for, so I eagerly nod, excited to hear what would happen next. When he peered into the hellscape that was engulfing his house, he thought he saw something along all the tiny flames. Well, more accurately, someone. A figure draped in tattered rags, with a hood pulled up around its head. When my uncle saw it, the thing leant back and let out an ear-piercing wail. Longer than the original, forcing my uncle to cover his ears to escape from the sudden pain. Not that it helped much, the scream apparently felt like it was drilling into his head. It's here that my uncle ends the story abruptly. He apparently didn't remember that much afterwards, only that his father was very angry with him, and no fire ever seemed to take place. What he saw was dismissed as hallucinations, introduced from the beatings or just lies. Even the broken glass might have just been his dad breaking the shit in their house. What is interesting is that soon afterwards, his father ended up dying of some sort of illness, which my uncle attributed to the fairy folk. Now obviously, there's plenty of room for doubt here. It may just be the invention of an abused mind. And like what I said before, the mind sees what it wants to see. After this, I had to give my uncle a day to recover. Telling the story had apparently brought back some bad memories, and he just spent the next few hours just sitting and reading through some old book about identifying plants. He's a big man with a big heart, and every day he tries his hardest not to be like his father. So I gave him some time, and it was a day later when I took him to the edge of the forest and started in my journal. We made a fire and sat by the woods for a bit, making some western style bannock, and just chatting generally about spooks and spirits. Like I said before, my uncle considered himself a keeper of the peace between the worlds, and especially keeping the peace sometimes involved evicting troublesome guests. For the most part, we apparently live alongside the fairy folk without even noticing them, but occasionally they act up and my uncle has to show them the metaphorical door. Something along the lines of an exorcism, but my uncle stressed the two practices were quite different. In his own words, he doesn't drive out demons or free souls from evil. 
He merely gently yet very firmly gets troublesome fairies to leave. And he only deals with the supernatural that he is familiar with. When I asked him if he could deal with a local creature, like maybe a Wendigo or a Skinwalker, he flatly said no. He had no real experience or idea of the habits, strengths, weaknesses or history of those creatures, and attempting to apply what worked in Ireland might just be a shot in the dark. According to him, acting in these situations without prior preparation and knowledge would sometimes be fatal, especially considering the darker reputation of some cryptids. Nothing much happened while we were at the edge of the woods, as per usual. The bannock was good. If you haven't had a chance to try some campfire bannock, you should really make a point of doing so. Eventually, we decided to pack up. My uncle had to visit more relatives before he went back to Ireland, and I still had a bedtime at that point. Besides, the forest was getting real quiet. Dark clouds were gathering, and the wind was starting to pick up the snow. All sure signs that some sort of storm was coming. My uncle wasn't used to the big storms we got, and I remember him looking around rather concerned and insisting we go, probably dreading walking back in heavy snowfall. You might think I'm trying to lead up to a spooky bit here about walking away and looking back to see an ominous tall man in the trees, but no, most we got was a lone deer walking out of the woods and keeping an eye on us. Nothing out of the ordinary in Western Canada. He departed the next day for BC and our extended family over there but he left me an old bird identification book and one of his cross necklaces, which were very nice of him. I wish we had more time. I barely get to see him and his stories really ignited my passion for cryptids and the supernatural. Since then, I've grown up quite a bit. No more bedtime, for example. I constantly go out looking for the supernatural, but perhaps I'm just not touched by the fairy folk in the same way my uncle is. I have some experiences that I cannot discredit, and I feel like I've had more of those ever since my uncle visited. But I'm still missing the big catch that I've been looking for. It's like when you see something just on the edge of your vision, and you turn to see nothing there. It feels like they're around me, but I'm just too stupid to notice or not fast enough to catch them. I came here looking for advice and maybe some stories on what best to do to interact and document any potential cryptids. Particularly the ones locals to the rocky area. And if I happen to piss off a particularly dangerous cryptid, perhaps some tips on how not to die. I'm an American Civil War reenactor. I was attending an event deep in North Carolina cotton country at the beginning of November, where we set up camp in the original fort that was on site. One of the things reenactors do to add some authenticity to events is to send out four to five guys on what's called picket duty. It's basically a safety watch that stands guard outside of camp at night. I wasn't too terribly tired that night, so I volunteered to be one of the four sentries to go and stand watch that night. Now, before we go to our respective posts, we all determine a call sign, so that way, should anyone come up to us, they can call out the call sign, make their presence known, and other camp. Our call sign for that night was O Virginia. Fast forward about two hours or so, it's now approximately 1.30 or 2am. I was posted along a stretch of trenches leading up to the main ford about 25 yards outside of camp. I was leaning against a tree, letting my mind wander, when I saw movement coming from a section of wood line. A figure emerged and began slowly making his way towards me. I snapped to the position of port arms and said to the figure, halt and make your presence known. The figure stopped only for a breath before saying, I am friendly. The figure came up to me, and he revealed himself to be a middle-aged man in confederate garb with sergeant stripes on the sleeves of his dirty jacket. I distinctly remember a strong sense of pipe tobacco coming from him. He made a brief bit of small talk with me, asking how my post was going, 
Did I kill any Billy Yanks? So on and so forth. As he finished his conversation and began to turn, he looked back and said, Got enough rounds in your box? Referring to my leather cartridge box that held my blank reenactor rounds for my muskets. I only had a few days left for the next day's event, so I said if he was offering, I could definitely use a few more. He dug around in his pockets for a second and produced three cartridges and placed them in my hand. Immediately, I knew they were live rounds. I felt the weight of the lead bullets in my hands. This is a serious no-no, as you are not allowed by any means whatsoever to bring live ammunition or bullets to a reenactment event. I stared at the cartridges in my hands for a moment, and when I looked back up to say that I could not accept these, the soldier was gone. All that was left was the smell of sweet pipe tobacco. I pocketed the rounds, finished my guard shift, and in the morning I put the three live rounds in my truck. I still have them now. I made a point of looking for that sergeant the following day, but to no avail. To this point, I'm unsure of the circumstances. Could it have been a fellow reenactor playing a joke? Someone trying to cause issues? Or maybe, potentially, a sergeant from a time long ago since past was keeping an eye out for a fellow soldier late at night. Whoever you are, sergeant, you stuck with me. Let's not meet under these circumstances again. <laughs>